Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's really impressive, the number of people out there and everything, and so this is really a great event. Um, and uh, I'm going to get to talk about my uh, favorite topic, uh, because there's so much going on right now from the standpoint of how the ear works and hearing and balance disorders. Um, and, and it's really an exciting time, because there's never really been as much going on and as clear on the horizon of what's coming of the exciting things. And what I wanted to do this morning is um, go over a little bit, let's see if we can get this uh, monitor going for us forward here. I may need to walk up there and touch the button. So can y'all hear me if I don't use the microphone? Is that clear? Excellent, good. So if it's okay, I'm gonna stand right here and hopefully I don't block y'all too much here. But I think the most important thing when we get started, if we're talking about hearing loss, are you having trouble? Oh, okay, uh, is that uh, this is not just uh, a function of age, it's not just a function of one specific group, and it turns out that it's something that can be identified everywhere from newborns all the way to someone who's older, and it can cause issues at all sorts of levels, and so what I wanted to talk about are a few things. You know, it, it's funny, when I told people I was giving this talk, everyone was telling me, you know, it really is a lot more common than you think, but people just don't want to admit it. And think about it, and uh, go to a restaurant, and how much do you hear, what do they say, or people whispering to each other or figuring things out. So it really matters. Uh, we're going to talk about how the ear works, we're going to talk about what goes wrong, and we're going to talk about what can be done to get it better and kind of what the perspective should be on this. So let's talk a little bit about some communication issues. And uh, it's a little hard to see in the corner, but there's a phone up there. And how many times have you had a phone that just won't quite give you the information that you want, and, and you're misinterpreting what they're saying? And then you get in trouble, right? Because you misinterpreted what they said, and you're fighting about something that you probably shouldn't have been fighting about anyway. Um, or how many times do you go to a restaurant and at, for a while you're doing okay, and then all of a sudden if there's background sound, you get in trouble. Or what's really the crisis is one-on-one, -on -one, male voice, quiet room, you can probably hear okay, but you go to a restaurant and that teenage waitress comes out and you have no idea what she said, right? Because it's going fast and it's going high-pitched and, and strategically, that's why, and we're going to talk about why the way the ear works is those high pitches are really important, and that's the first thing to go. Uh, and so in social situations, it's an issue. Now, there are some other aspects of it, but the reality of it is that we live in a hearing world. Now, if you have no hearing and no opportunity to hear, it is true that there are some very useful uh, ways to communicate. American Sign Language is the third most common language in the United States, which is really pretty remarkable if you think about it. Uh, having said that, all things being equal, if you can hear, there's an awful lot more opportunity for you in work, in earning a living, and in social interactions. And so I think that because of that, it becomes a real issue. And we'll talk about work a little bit. And there, there's no question that being able to effectively communicate in a work environment is the difference between succeeding and not succeeding. And not only being able to listen, but then to be able to articulate and to understand some of the nuances, right? Someone can tell you the same thing in a different tone of voice, and it means exactly the opposite. And if you're just struggling to figure out what the words were, you're missing that second and third level of meaning, which is the difference between getting that promotion or not getting that promotion. And so someone tells you they're about to tell you the secret of how you're going to get that promotion, and we'll see if y'all can hear this. Ah, maybe not, huh? Let's see if we can get this woken up here. Y'all remember this? Nope, it's not making sound. Remember the teacher's voice on Charlie Brown? That's what a lot of patients tell me it sounds like when they're trying to communicate, is that wah, wah, wah sound. And what on earth did that mean? And if that was the big deal, and someone just whispered to you the secret of how to get it, you're in trouble. And, and this problem goes way back. This is a quote from uh, uh, Beethoven, 
who basically was afraid of admitting that he was deaf because he was the one that was supposed to really be the expert on sound and how to communicate and, and it was supposed to be the sense that he, that he possessed to perfection. And so he was afraid to even let people know about it. And one of the most important things and the reason I was excited to be here that, that it's very critical that we understand is th this is not just a decorative problem or a convenience problem. It really is a fundamental health issue. There's been some great research just finished at the NIH that it turns out that untreated hearing loss is a significant risk factor for developing dementia. And think about it. Think about friends that you've had or people that you know and think about what some of the early signs were. You know, you start having a little bit of hearing loss, you don't hear what's going on around you, family and friends get frustrated and they say, oh, never mind, I'll figure it out on my own. Next thing you know, you're isolated, and then that becomes a cycle that can cause some measurable changes in how the brain works. This is a special type of brain scan called a PET scan that's done looking when sound is being played and looking at the brain activity as a result of that. And this is someone with a significant loss on one side, and you can see what happens at that level, that the brain activity changes. And as a result of that, it actually turns out that there's a very sophisticated cycle related to untreated hearing loss and a higher risk for dementia. Not only is it a matter of social isolation, but as that part of the senses are having more trouble, the brain has to direct more activity to hearing, less activity to other cognitive uh, functions, and before you know it, it's a cycle that can really cause issues. So we're taking it much more seriously. Years ago, you know, 20 some odd years ago, I'd see people in the office, often a husband and a wife, the wife kind of dragging the husband in, the wife complaining that the husband couldn't hear, the husband trying to convince me that yes, he could hear very much. I didn't make a big deal of it, right? I figured, you know, I'm not going to win this argument. This is something that's been going on long before I was even around. I'm not going to get in the middle of this one. But, but now I do. And, and the reason is just what we talked about, those risk factor issues. And, and there's another aspect of hearing loss that's important. Um, there are medical issues related to it. And, you know, at the beginning you saw in my name that I do something called neurootology. And what that means is I was trained first as an ear, nose, and throat doctor. And then I did special training in this little field where all I do is take care of hearing problems, balance problems, and brain tumors related to the ear. And it turns out one of the first signs, in fact, the first sign of one of this type of brain tumor, which is called an acoustic neuroma, is a decrease in hearing on one side. So when someone tells me that one ear is weaker than the other, my antenna go up. Because as far as I'm concerned, that is one of these acoustic tumors until proven otherwise. And there's some special tests that need to be done. And that's why I get shivers down my spine when I hear people just picking up the phone and ordering a hearing aid because one of their ears is just a little bit weaker than the other. Well, that's the warning sign. This actually turned out uh, to be a, a young man uh, when I was actually in the Air Force. He had been in the Air Force for 10 years, and this fellow had been uh, describing hearing loss on one side, and no one really thought it was important. And then we ultimately got the scan when he started stumbling on his way to fix a C-130 airplane engine one day. And, uh, and this is what we found. And so yeah, ideally, you want to find these when they're tiny. And we often do now. And at that point, it's not a life-threatening issue, but instead, it's a matter of function and preservation. Just so you know what you're seeing here, this is a scan with someone laying down, their feet facing you, their eyes looking up. And what you're seeing here is the back of the brain. And what you're seeing here is something called the stem of the brain that darker area. This bright area is the tumor. And you see on the normal side, it's nice and flat. And here, it looks like someone stuffed their fist in there and is putting pressure. 
And you can imagine that if the brain is really a lot of nerve connections, you put that kind of pressure on this, uh, these nerves and they're not going to work too well. There are other issues medically that hearing loss uh, can indicate, and so we take it seriously. It's, it's a sign, uh, potentially, of other things going on. So let's talk about how this works. And, it, and it's really an, an, elegant, uh, an elegant organ. Uh, the way this works, it, and you know, your, your outer ear doesn't get a lot of credit. You know, people figure it's just where you hang your glasses. Turns out you get a few decibels, which is how we measure hearing sound intensity, from just the outer ear. And then the ear canal uh, gives you some uh, amplification. But then you reach the eardrum. The sound then goes across the little bones of hearing. We call them ossicles. Y'all remember from school the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup bone, malleus, incus, and stapes. And then finally, the sound reaches the inner ear, which is where the cochlea is, which is that snail. And we're going to talk about that, because inside of there are these little cells called hair cells that are specialized, and the only thing they can do is detect sound, give you a sound impulse uh, at that level. Now, this is a, uh, a picture of what your eardrum actually looks like. Uh, and when I look with an otoscope or when I look with a microscope, this is what I see. And what you can kind of get a sense is you almost see almost like a, a cellophane or a saran wrap, and then behind it, you can see some other issues. So this first area here, that's the malleus or the hammer bone. Then behind, you can see the anvil bone, and then you can kind of see the shadow of the stirrup bone back there. I tell people it's kind of like looking through a shower curtain, right? You can sort of see, but not completely, but after you see a bunch of things, you kind of know what's back there. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of what the normal situation is. Um, if you think about the inner ear, though, uh, the part way in here, it's more complicated than just that jelly roll of a, uh, of a coil there. Inside this coil, if you look at it here, and you just look at one little section, there's some fluid compartments and there are these little cells. And we call these cells hair cells. And there are two groups. There are the inner ones and the outer ones. The inner ones are the basic detectors, but the outer ones are the important ones uh, in terms of fine tuning and in terms of letting you know what happens with the ear. Um, so if you took a look, with a special microscope, you can see all those little fibers in there. Those are the actual nerve endings stained in a special way, so you can kind of get a sense of how they connect further in. If instead of looking at it on the side, you look at it from on top, looking down at these little tufts of these hair cells, you can see what those normal hair cells look like. And we'll talk about this in a second and ways to damage it. But let's just take one of those cells. And let's see what it does for fine tuning. This is a real cell connected right here. Here is its connections. And look how it responds to sound. It's just a little floating thing in the back and the liquid. So that's an actual human hair cell grown in a Petri dish and with the connections that are there and you can actually see what's happening at the inner ear level. So just imagine how delicate that is and how easy it is to mess that up in terms of sound or other things. So let's talk a little bit about what can go wrong. So there are basically two types of hearing loss. There's mechanical hearing loss, we call it conductive, and there's nerve hearing loss. And the difference becomes important as you'll see as we talk about this. So there are all sorts of simple things, like at the top, wax. Just wax in the ear can cause a mechanical hearing loss. That's my favorite kind of hearing loss, because I can cure that in a jickety split. Uh, the second problem, and you know a lot of kids and grandkids have this, is fluid behind the eardrum. Or you can have a hole in the eardrum, or damage to the inner ear. So when I look at an ear, I'm looking for the normal structures, but then if I see something bulging, like here, or kind of some whitish stuff. Remember I mentioned you can have a cyst behind the eardrum? The eardrum isn't cellophane, it's skin. And if that skin starts growing behind the eardrum, that'll keep growing. It'll dissolve the hearing bones, it can dissolve the inner ear, and it can even go to the brain.
which again goes back to why we take it seriously if you've got a hearing loss because there's some potential medical issues. Sometimes you look behind the ear and you see something that's a little unusual and it's important to get it looked at closely. This is a, a young girl who had a uh, mechanical hearing loss in one ear and somebody thought that she might benefit from putting tubes in her ear. And when you looked closely, she had an unusual shape of her ear and you see that kind of tube sitting back there, that tubular tissue structure? That's the main artery to her brain. That's the carotid artery that wasn't covered by bone. And so tubes would not really be a good idea in this situation. You want to leave that alone, all things being equal. Well, what are some common things that cause problems? Well, Q-tips. <laughs> Believe it or not, putting Q-tips in the ear is the opposite of how the ear was designed. You know that nice ear canal I showed you? The only place you form wax is in the outer third of that canal. So for me, it's very easy when I look with a microscope, if I see wax up against the eardrum and pushed in there and plus a few cotton fibers, I know how that got there, okay? What happened is you thought you were cleaning it, but you were pushing it in. I always tell people, remember those movies with like the Civil War cannons and you see a guy with a big stick shoving the gunpowder in there? He wasn't shoving that stick in there to get the gunpowder out, all right? And that's kind of what you're doing with a Q-tip. You're pushing it in. And so I'd be careful about that, and especially, especially diabetics. If you're diabetic, your defenses aren't as good, and there's a horrible infection that can happen that can actually be fatal from scratching the ear canal and just getting water in there. So you've got to be very, very careful in terms of cleaning. There's some other things we can look when we look in there. Sometimes the eardrum is missing. It makes it easier to see the little hearing bones, but that creates a mechanical problem. The nerve is still okay. So this person is not deaf, but they have about a 50% hearing loss because that's what the mechanics do in terms of what's going on. So we've developed various surgical strategies to fix these mechanical problems. And some of them you're very aware of. For instance, tubes. You see at the top, those are all the different types of tubes that are placed in children's ears and adults' ears. And what the tube does, it's nothing more than after you drain the fluid behind the eardrum, by putting the tube in there, it keeps the hole open for about a year or so. Usually these tubes fall out on their own. Remember I told you the drum is growing, and as it grows, it pushes that tube out of the way. We can go behind the eardrum and fix the little hearing bones themselves if they're not vibrating properly. We can replace a hearing bone if it's not working properly. There's a type of replacement called stapedectomy, which is really the reason I went into ear, ear work in the first place. I remember as a medical student seeing an operation that was an outpatient operation that was uh, quick with neat equipment like a laser and um, really resulted in a high rate of success. And, and what's involved is you're replacing the stirrup bone with an artificial bone to restore the vibration. So if the loss is mechanical, this is a very successful strategy where you use these fancy uh, little prosthesis. Now this looks huge up here. It's what, two or three feet tall. In, in the operating room, it's the size of a grain of rice. And so what you're doing then is with the microscope, uh, you're using the laser to get rid of the non-working stirrup bone and you replace it with one of these. And after you put it in position, when you hit it with the laser, it kind of crimps right around. It shrink wraps right on the anvil bone, which is kind of neat. Now let's talk about the inner ear a little bit. And uh, as I was uh, sitting here talking about and thinking about different uh, hearing loss issues, I like to think about the problem that most people have understanding. It's a strategic problem. Most of my patients tell me, you know, I can hear just fine. I just can't understand. And here's why. This is a graph of hearing, okay? At this side are the low tones. Low tones correspond to vowels. At the high tones are the consonants. The lower down you are, the louder a sound has to be for you to be able to hear it. And what typically happens is that the low tones are okay and the high tones go down. What does that mean? It means you're hearing the vowels, you're not picking up the consonants. So, hat, bat, cat, rat. 
all sound the same when you're in that background sound at the restaurant and the teenage waitress comes out and you're in trouble, right? Because if you say, why would I want to have rat for dinner? You know, it's like a, diff a completely different conversation, right? And so there are a lot of ways you can get in trouble, but it's strategic. And so the goal is to try to get those tones that you're having the trouble with boosted up so that your communication can get better. Now, hearing loss, you know, people say, oh, it's always just age. And, and age is a part of it, but there are a lot of other things. Your genes, what it was like in your family, what your work was. Um, were you sick? Did you need chemotherapy? There's some chemotherapies that can affect things. There's some diuretics that can affect things. Um, there are different infections. There are liver disease, kidney disease. We talked about tumors. We talked about cysts. So it's important to know why. And it is true, if you look on that curve, the circles are kind of the average level at about age 30. Uh, and then the squares, at about age 40, you lose about 10 points at the highest tones. Uh, at age 50, 20 points. Age 60, 30 points, but just at the highest tones. But you see, aging doesn't make you deaf. This is a group of people that were screened and followed, a huge group of people. Other things can enter into the equation. Noise is a big one. And unprotected ears around noise are a really big deal. So you see the little kid with the firecracker. Um, on the right, you see this pretty famous ad for iPods. Uh, uh, and the big thing with those iPods and your MP3 players and your smartphones that can play music, you never want to have it over 50% volume. Because if after hearing a sound or if you have to raise your voice to be heard, you're actually damaging those little hairs that we showed you. And have any of you ever been to a concert and then you walk out and your ears kind of feel stuffy and you hear a little ringing afterwards? That's called temporary threshold shift. What has happened is the nerve endings have been bruised. They'll get better, but if you keep doing that, they won't get any better. You're born with 30,000 of these and we don't grow them back. Chickens grow them back. We can't figure out yet why chickens can grow them back, but people can't grow them back. And, uh, and so that's a problem because you've got to protect what you've got. And, uh, and there really is a very strong effort now to, uh, to be careful about loud noise and the effect of noise. Um, other, it, and, and noise has a, a, a characteristic, it's almost like a fingerprint, that I can look at your hearing test and have a good idea if noise was a cause. And what you're seeing that's different is we call this a notch. You see how the hearing goes down at the high tones and then goes back up? And it's usually right at 4,000 hertz, which is some of the consonant sounds. But it's like a fingerprint that I can tell by looking at a hearing test was noise a big deal and what happened. All right, here's the test. So you've got a picture of two people firing a rifle as right-handed shooters. Which ear will be worse? What's that? Right, yeah. I have a right, I have a left. I'm thinking left. left. Well, both will be hit hard, but it turns out your head works as a little bit of a sound protection to the side opposite, right? So if you're looking downrange as a right handed shooter, that left ear is facing downrange. It's going to get more, and there, your head is actually blocking some of the sound, and your right one is relatively protected. So, so that's kind of what's going on there. But what that tells you is just the protection, just the shadow of your head physically being there is enough to give you some shielding. Earplugs and hearing protection is very, very important. And y'all saw this picture earlier, and what you, you, what you can see is there are some normal cells, but you see all those little nubbins sitting around? That's what's left over after a noise exposure situation. And so you can really knock things out. So plugs, muffs, uh, and different uh, categories of, of protection are out there. Oftentimes, on the side of these uh, boxes, it'll give you a number, a noise reduction rating. Don't completely trust that, because there's a, a complicated formula of how it ends up that it's really protecting you. Most of those plugs will give you about 10 decibels of protection, just the little foam ones on a practical level. Uh, but if you find yourself in a really loud environment and, you know, you're, for whatever reason, your airplane, the jetway didn't come and you have to walk off the plane but the engines are still running around, 
put some moist tissue paper, put your finger in front of your ear, do something, because you can get a, a, a noise exposure over 90 decibels very quickly that can be very damaging. Now, one thing I'm going to point out, especially at a men's health uh, uh, symposium, that, that we need to be aware of, and that's a warning out there. And I don't know if y'all have ever been able to hear on these commercials for, you know, anything, any drug on TV, that the guy comes out and says 100 words as quickly as you can and you don't hear a single one. Well, one of the words that they say on the Viagra commercials is the possibility of hearing loss. And there is a relationship. We don't know yet how often, and we don't know why, but there is a relationship there, uh, and it seems to be related to people having a condition called sudden hearing loss. So it's something that if you've had this already in one ear or you've just got one ear, talk to your doctor about finding the one with the least risk. There are different types of these medications out there, and it depends. And there are medical things within the ear itself uh, in terms of extra fluid in the ear. The ear can develop a type of glaucoma. Uh, we call it Meniere's disease, when the fluid backs up and can damage the ear. All right, well, what can we do if, uh, if something goes wrong? Well, you know, there are, there are a lot of things. Obviously, if there's a growth, it's something that we take out. But the main thing that we do for people with the nerve losses is there are all sorts of devices. And uh, when I first started 25 years ago, you know, hearing aids were it, and they weren't all that good, and there were a lot of problems with them, and people kind of hated them. Well, that's gotten really, really exciting. There's all sorts of miniaturization and computerization and selecting the tones. But the other things that have happened are even neater. There are implantable middle ear devices that will vibrate the hearing bones directly. There are ways to put pins behind the ear to vibrate the skull to send the sound in in that fashion. And if the nerves don't work at all, there's a technology called cochlear implants that's really very neat because even if all those little hairs have died, you can electrically stimulate in there and it will reach the main nerve and send the sound to the brain in that fashion. So we've gone a long way in terms of the evolution of the types of devices that are out there. Um, and you know, it, it's funny because we, when we're all talking about hearing loss or you're in an environment you can't hear, instinctively you do this, right? Well, you actually do get five or ten decibels just by doing that. So, it, so it's not that crazy. You're actually being helped there. And, um, you know, the, the ancients had figured out that if you had speaking tubes, you could actually get ten or fifteen decibels that way. And that's why they hollowed out horns and things like that. And uh, the early hearing aids were big and bulky, no question about it. And the technology now has really, uh, really evolved quite nicely. Uh, there's there are a whole spectrum of devices out there, uh, from behind the ear devices to in the canal devices to in the ear devices. Some of these are completely invisible. Some of these are, are truly just uh, placed all the way in. Um, this category of device is, to me, one of my favorites because remember I told you that one of the big problems is that you usually still have the low tones but lose the high tones. And a lot of times we used to think that, well, it was just a cosmetic thing that people didn't want anything sitting there. It's actually more than that. If you don't plug up the ear canal, you don't mess around with the low tones. So you actually make the sound clearer and more natural than if you plug everything up. And that's why those newer devices, it's not only that they look better, they actually work better on a scientific basis. And there are all sorts of other things out there beyond just the hearing aid issues, although the hearing aids are very important uh, and the di different digital processing. Uh, I don't know if any of you have hearing aids, you have the remote controls where you can have different programs. Those have been very good and they're getting better regularly. So a couple of things about hearing aids. First of all, any reputable place will let you go through a month trial first. When you're going through that trial, work real hard with your audiologist. Go back and forth until it's right. If it's not right and you're getting near the end of that trial, ask them to extend your trial. What you don't want to do is you don't want to hang on to it to the magic two-month point and then they'll say, well, we're sorry, Mr. Smith, but you know, your two months are over, so you now have a nice expensive decoration for your sock drawer. 
right? You don't, you don't want that. You want to have something that's really helpful for you. Uh, and the other thing is that if you work real closely with them, they can oftentimes optimize what they're doing for you. Now, there are some situations where um, hearing aids can be made to work even better. So many churches, many theaters have these loop systems where there's a wire going around the, uh, the room that you're sitting in that can communicate directly to your hearing aid. And so it's kind of like having the sound piped in. These things are actually very, very common, but very few people take advantage of them. So make sure you talk to your dispenser about, uh, about ways of optimizing that aspect as well. Okay? Um, one other little trick, especially around here. You know, when you walk from here to your car, more likely than not, you're going to get kind of sweaty. If you've got something in your ear, your ear is going to get kind of sweaty, and the device can have problems or it can lead to an infection. A hair dryer towards your ear for about 20 seconds at the end of the day works great to dry it out, prevent infections in the ear, and protect that hearing aid as well. Now, take the hearing aid out. Don't shoot the hair dryer at the hearing aid. The, the goal is, is to try to get it dried out in there, but, but it's really a very nice trick, and especially in this environment, or if you go swimming and you're just not sure you got everything out of there, 20 or 30 seconds on a low volume really is a nice little trick to make it work better. All right. Now, you know, it's impossible for me to be at a session talking about hearing loss and not hear that someone had problems with a hearing aid. Have you, has anyone ever heard that, that someone didn't like their hearing aid? You know, <laughs> right, exactly. And so, you know, at the end of the day, they still call them hearing aids, right? They're not ear replacements. So we're, we're trying to redo what nature originally designed in a very elegant fashion. And there's some issues. Uh, they can be uncomfortable. In certain situations, they can make you appear uh, different at the work environment. If you plug up the ear canal, it can make the sound have a different quality that sounds tinny or boxy or enclosed. If you choose, sometimes it opens up and moves within your ear and can cause issues. And background sound and distortion can sometimes cause problems. We've gone a long way to getting those things better, but not enough. And for example, the mo one of the recent studies showed that of the 28 million people in the US who probably should use hearing aids, only 15% actually do. So the percentage of people that don't use them is, is pretty large. And that's why, fortunately, it's been a reason that a lot of companies have been developing new strategies. So this crazy slide is just an overview of the different non-traditional hearing aids that are out there different surgically implanted devices that are out there. Um, and there are a couple that are FDA approved. Uh, there are some that we'll talk about that actually insurances still cover, although there's something I'm going to ask you to talk about about that. And some of these uh, are, are really changing. So one of the devices that's out there, and this one doesn't require an operation, is something called the Lyric, where if someone wants nothing at all outside, this deep part is placed right close to the eardrum, and then the outer part can be removed or replaced if it gets wet and that sort of thing. So the appeal there is that you don't have anything on the outside. Another strategy, this is called the Sound Tech or the Maxim. And remember I showed you the ear canal before. So you place this hearing aid in the ear, can this hearing device in the ear canal, but at the end here is electricity and magnets. There's a strong magnet that's sitting there. And what that does is it moves another magnet that we place surgically right at the junction between the anvil and the stirrup. And what that means is, instead of playing sound in the ear, the electricity vibrates the hearing bones directly. And so it's not a very uh, difficult uh, procedure to go through. It's outpatient. There's another device. If the hearing bones are totally lost or the eardrum is totally lost, it's something called the Baja, where a pin is placed behind the ear. You put the hearing aid on top of that pin, and so when sound comes in, it vibrates the bone, and those bone vibrations go right to the inner ear. So if you've got a mechanical problem with the ear, if you were born without an ear canal, you had trauma and you lost your hearing bones, or if you've got no hearing in that ear, the skull will vibrate and it'll send it over to the other side. 
and there are even versions now that don't have to go through the skin. One of those versions is called the Sifono, where we place these little magnets under the skin, and then on the outside you just wear this. Now, if you can't wear anything in the ear canal, this is a neat little device. It's actually been approved since about 2000 in the U.S. So for people who feel that their hearing aids just aren't giving them the clarity that they want, vibrating the hearing bones directly has a benefit. And this is the SoundBridge device. And what I'll show you is we actually place this little tiny magnet and attach it to the anvil bone. And what happens then is when the sound comes in to the little processor on the outside, an electric signal gets sent across the skin and that'll vibrate the little hearing bones. It makes it clearer in that fashion. Uh, there's some other devices coming down the road. This one is in Europe right now, but will make it to the U.S. soon. It's called the Bone Bridge, nothing outside. And there's one device I wanted to talk to you about a little bit because been, there's been a lot of advertising about it, and I want to tell you the good things and the bad things about it. This thing is called the Esteem, and it's the first totally implanted hearing aid in the U.S. And I was fortunate, before coming back home, I was in Pittsburgh for about 15 years, and I got to put the first one of these in the U.S. And it's really an exciting device, but there's some limitations, and I want to make sure we all understand what they are. So what happens with this device is sound comes in the ear canal, vibrates the eardrum, and you connect a little sensor on the hearing bones that detects the vibrations. That sends the sound to a processor that looks kind of like a pacemaker and it processes the sound and sends it back to the stirrup bone and vibrates the bones directly in that fashion. And there's some great things about this. First of all, you're using the natural eardrum. Secondly, there's nothing outside. Um, and so that's very appealing. It's kind of a neat concept. What, what they've done is they've taken these piezo crystals. Anyone have a piezoelectric radio or a piezo radio when they were little? Remember those kits that they used to sell in the, out of the magazines? I'm old enough to remember those. But anyway, they, uh, they were kind of neat. But they worked because if you have two crystals together of this type, if you move them, they create a little electric signal. On the other hand, if you put an electric signal through there, it'll move the crystals. And so that's why the movement of the eardrum is enough to act like a microphone. And then if you turn around and give a little current, it's enough to act like a speaker on the stirrup bone. You control it with an outside programmer. And I'm going to show you how we actually put it in. And here's a picture of me putting one in where I'm actually connecting to the uh, anvil bone as I'm putting the uh, little microphone device that's going to be implanted. And then we put a special bone cement. And so this is actual footage from surgery. Um, and, and it's really exciting that, uh, that this is able to work that well. Uh, the problem is that it's a lot of surgery. So it's usually a couple of hours of surgery. And so about half of people with these have done great. But the other half have had to have revisions and that sort of thing. So when people ask me about this, I say, yeah, it's out there. Uh, but I'm not really encouraging people in that direction unless you know exactly what you're getting into. Because if you look very closely in our uh, medical journals, uh, it's been about a 50-50 proposition of home runs versus not. And that's an awful lot of surgery to sit still for. So I'd say hold off for a second if you're thinking about the total implantable ones right now. There is something really cool out there, though, and it's called the ear lens. And this is just getting into uh, research trials. And what you're seeing is a blown-up view of this uh, little uh, device that's got a clear cellophane about the size of a cornflake. And on that is a light sensor and a little tiny motor that works from that light sensor. So you wear your device back here, and instead of sending sound in, you shoot a laser light at that light detector. It's kind of like a mini solar panel on your eardrum. And when it hits, it vibrates the eardrum. And that's actually kind of, kind of neat because we're really excited that it's got a lot less parts and a lot less manipulation of the ear. Because you can imagine, anytime you do anything surgically, we have to talk about risks. And so it minimizes some of the risk issues. All right. So what, what happens if the nerves are all gone? Now what? Well, that's when we start thinking about cochlear implants. 
And remember I told you that these are devices where instead of using the natural hearing mechanism, what you're doing is putting a wire into the inner ear itself. So this wire then connects to a processor that's under the skin. And on the outside, you wear something that looks like a hearing aid. And then it sticks to this across the skin just by a magnet. So sound hits here. Electrical signal gets sent into the ear. And then it electrically stimulates the inner ear. This is what one of these setups looks like. This is what we actually surgically implant. This is what's worn on the outside of that magnet. This is what you wear. And that's your remote control. You know, God forbid, if you were to walk outside and get hit by lightning and lose your hearing, with one of these, within a month, you'd be back to work using the telephone because you meet the criteria, meaning you know that sound has meaning, you know that you already have language and spoken words, so it'll be a, a little bit of a transition. I've had patients tell me it's like learning French through broken speakers, but because you've got the basic building blocks there, you'll do well. On the other hand, if you've been deaf all your life, and at age 50 you decide you want to hear, you know, it's not going to make a lot of sense because your brain hasn't been used to turning that signal into useful communication. So that's where the, the issues come up. This is just an x-ray of what one looks like once it's placed. And oftentimes there are these straight little wires that when you take out a little holding uh, uh, wire, it curls right up in the inner ear, sort of like that. And what's neat is that this has gone from being something that very few people qualified, half of a percent, to now about 5% of people I see in the office meet the criteria for some of these devices. And a new one has just been approved by the FDA that actually expands that even more. So it turns out that we are able to put these devices in if you still have some nerve function and preserve the nerve function that's there, so still using that natural part, but then electrically stimulating the part that's not working. So that has changed a bit. Now, one quick word on tinnitus or tinnitus. Anybody ever heard of that? Ringing in the ears or anything like that? Exactly. And, and that's a function, usually, of hearing loss. Remember, these, brain, these inner ear cells connect directly to brain cells. And if you lose the ear connections, the brain connections are still there. And often they'll start firing, trying to make up for the sound that your ear isn't giving you. For a lot of people, doing things like watching sodium and caffeine, uh, stress can make this a lot worse. Turns out if you stimulate the remaining working part of the ear, it's very effective at decreasing the intensity for lots of people. There are all sorts of new treatments. The best one is something called tinnitus retraining therapy, which can be very time consuming, but has a high success rate. But for most people, just using some um, boosting up the sound and using some of the newer tinnitus devices that cause some brain retraining to occur is really neat. What's on the horizon? Well, what, what I'm excited about is LSU is actually on, on one of the leading edges of, of fixing some of this on a, on a chemical and molecular level. One of the members of our department um, was instrumental in identifying a gene that causes a type of hearing loss called Usher's syndrome. Well, Usher's turns out to be very common in the Acadian population. So we've got more people with Usher's in Louisiana than anywhere else. And it turns out there's a gene that can cause this. And she's figured out a way to first she gave it to some mice, so these mice got it. And when they have this condition, they're blind, they're running around in circles, and they're deaf. And she figured out a way to insert into their um, genetic system a little molecule that prevents that gene from taking hold. And so far, she's cured these mice. And so we're really excited because we think there'll be a way of actually applying that to humans very soon. And this is the first of what's definitely going to be a lot of other changes coming of treating these conditions, not with surgery and implants, but with chemical changes and things like that. Other things that are out there, there are supplements and things like that. Be careful. There's no magic yet like that, okay? Some of these can be helpful. A good multivitamin with a lot of the B complexes is useful. But the bottom line is there are things you can do to prevent it. Noise protection, earplugs, that sort of thing. 
Before you just get some hearing aids, get it evaluated. Make sure it's not one of those more serious things that's going on out there. And the good news is there are lots of choices, right? So the future, I think, is bright for us. All right, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So, yes, sir. Yeah, well, we'll just go right down the road. These RELA elaborate implants, mm -hmm. uh, how does the qualification of age, I'm 80, uh, would you th think about putting the implant for me? Or you know, where does it taper off? The part of that ear is worn out, so it isn't something that. And, uh, well, yeah, and it is worn out, and so then the question is what needs to happen to, to, to make it work? So there's 80 and there's 80, right? So it, it's a matter of how functional you are and what's going on and whether your medical doctor thinks you can tolerate a one-hour operation uh, if you're going to go that far or, and, or if you want to go that far. But it's a matter of knowing what the choices are, and it's a lifestyle issue. So far, the oldest I've done a cochlear implant is on a 95-year-old. Uh, who was very healthy and was running a family business and said, you know, I'm not giving up, I'm not ready to give up, and, you know, can you make me function better? And went fine. But, you know, uh, it's very individualized. So, so fortunately in this country, we don't say, sorry, you know, you're 80, you just don't qualify. You know, we, 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 let, we individualize it. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, the uh, balance system has four parts. Your ear, your vision, information you get from your muscles and joints, and the way your brain puts it all together. And balance testing, VNG is just one small part of it. Uh, VNG, what he's referring to is um, if I put cold and warm water in your ears, your eyes are going to wiggle. And how quickly they wiggle based on the temperature of the water and whatnot, gives me a sense of how strong one of the balance canals in the inner ear is. There's another test where we put you in a chair and we put some special goggles. The chair doesn't move that quickly, but when you get moved, your inner ear works like a motion detector, a gyroscope, if you will, and it controls the movement of your eyes. That tells us how well that is working. There are ways we can measure the electrical activity of the inner ear. So remember those hair cells and all that movement? This is not just a mechanical system, it's electrical. The inner ear is a battery, and we can measure that electrical function. So that's a long-winded answer to say what those tests let us do is pinpoint what's going right, what's going wrong, and treatments of balance problems range anywhere from special diets to using diuretics to dry the ear out, We'll sometimes put injections in the ear of steroids or certain antibiotics that have effects on the inner ear. We'll sometimes do operations to help drain the fluid when it's built up. If crystals are loose and we can't just put you through maneuvers to put the crystals back, there are operations where we can cut off parts of the ear with plugging it to, and keep the rest of the ear working. There are times where we'll go around the nerves of the ear and put sponges between blood vessels that are putting pressure. So there are all sorts of things that can be done. And so the more information I have at the front end lets me pick which one of those treatments makes sense rather than just shotgunning it and say, well, here's the textbook. Let's just do all of these and hope that one of them works. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So, so it helps us pinpoint. Yes, sir. You had that earlier about tinnitus and so there's some type of therapy. Mm -hmm. So where do you go for tinnitus therapy? So um, the best tinnitus therapy uh, that's around that was described, there's something called the Jastrobov technique. It was described by a guy who's at Emory a couple of years ago. And the, the most elaborate one is called TRT, and it's kind of like a two-year process working with a clinical psychologist and a noise machine uh, that will create some sounds to train your brain to not be upset by that. So, so that formal one is not yet available in Louisiana. There are some less formal versions. Uh, there's something called uh, the Neuromonics device that at LSU in New Orleans is available. There's a fellow up in Alexandria that has that. And there's a less um, 
That, that one involves some formal counseling and training. There's one that's even less of that that we do in the Hearing and Balance Center and other places in the area do. There's some of the hearing aids have been retrofitted or forward fitted, if you will, with uh, a type of tinnitus retraining sound therapy called Zen sounds that force the brain to reprogram itself of how it's processing. And I guess what I'm trying to say is if you think about tinnitus or tinnitus, as just being the sound that your brain makes in response to no hearing coming in. If I took everybody in this room and put them in a soundproof booth, I'd bet 99% of people had some tinnitus going on. For some people, that sound gets to the point that it's troublesome, that it's bothering, and there's a filter in the brain, the limbic system, and if it crosses that filter, then it's something that's bugging you. So as you're sitting there and I ask you, how does your little toe feel in your shoe? Well, you didn't even think about that until I mentioned it, but now you can feel it and you know what it's like. But it's, it's still below the limbic system getting upset. If, on the other hand, that crosses the limbic system, the only thing you're going to think about all day is that toe bugging you all the time. And so the goal of these therapies is to reestablish that filter. And so that's the first strategy that's out there. Interestingly, there's some brain implant strategies out there, kind of like for Parkinson's with tremors and that sort of thing. Uh, there are medications that can be used. So, so, so there are some formal strategies out there, and there's a lot of neat information and research going on about that. Yes, sir. Yes, I have an office here in Baton Rouge at the lake. Okay, well, very good. Be happy to see you. Yes, sir. How do we know that an audiologist is qualified to treat us and to? Well, I think um, most, well, what, it is a law in this state that an audiologist cannot give you a hearing aid without either a an exam by a physician or you signing a form that waives that right. So a lot of times what happens is audiologists will ask you to just sign the waiver form. So um, I just make sure you get seen by a physician who knows about ears. Uh, is, is if my physician is recommending an audiologist, is that a good sign? That's a good sign. And especially if your physician is someone that does hearing issues and that sort of thing. So if it's your, you know, your ear doctor sends you to an audiologist, then you're fine. You know, because they've thought about what's going on with your hearing. You know, some of these growths and things that I've pointed out, they're not that common, but it just breaks my heart when I see someone's been wearing a hearing aid for 10 years and I'm dealing with a tumor the size of my fist. You know, it just, it, it didn't have to happen that way. Yes, sir. So you and the daughter have a lot of knowledge made about Rush Limbaugh? Yes. Hearing problems. Mm -hmm. But you have to go to Canada to get the implant that he got. Is that available here? Well, it, it's funny. Uh, Rush was actually implanted by one of my teachers in Los Angeles. Uh, Antonio Dela Cruz implanted him. And Rush actually has a cochlear implant. And then Rush was hired by the Esteem people. Remember that totally implantable device? And was advertising the Esteem. But he didn't have an Esteem. Mm -hmm. He had a cochlear implant. <laughs> and so, so. Uh, I heard the Esteem sounded Yeah, so that's. That, who yeah. So just so you know, esteem is not covered by insurance, and it's uh, 40 grand cash. That's what I heard. And so, before you sign up for that, no, 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 do no. your research on that one. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know, my, my concern is whenever you turn on the TV, you know, you hear ear relief, tinnitus cure, the ear pill. It, it's not that kind of magic. Basically, it's as long as you're taking a multivitamin that has B complex in it, you're doing what you need to do. There's some ideas that some of the antioxidants may be helpful, but these aren't cures. These are supplements to some of the other things that are going on out there. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and if you're, you're taking a theragram or a once a day or something like that, you're, you're covered. You know, there's more money being spent on vitamins that get flushed <laughs> one way or another uh, than, than, than can be imagined. Yes, sir. When I first went to an audiologist, the first thing they told me was something I already knew, that 
that I had a hearing loss. What disturbs me now from your lecture is that I don't even remember signing this document or seeing a physician I may have, I don't remember. But uh, my left ear is definitely more lost than in the right ear. I have a, a, a fair, pretty good hearing aids now. But is this something I should come see you about, uh, the possibility you know, of tuning in every you know, that ear? Yeah, you know, if it's different, I mean, I don't want to scare you. I don't, you know, statistically, you don't have a tumor. But having said that, when I see you in the office, if you've got a difference in hearing in one side, I'll do the test. I'll, I'll order the test. Just because I've learned over the years that you just can't predict it. And I just, once I see a difference, even if you tell me you're a hunter, even if you tell me you're a right-handed shooter, you know, I want to be able to look you eyeball to eyeball and say, sir, it's fine. The scan came back fine. There's nothing there. So I think, I think that's worthwhile. Yes, sir. Can your balance be affected by either like walking in the daylight or at nighttime? Absolutely. And the reason is that, remember, the balance system has four parts. And if the ear part and the muscle and joint part isn't working too well, you're very visually dependent. And so the minute we take away vision, you're in trouble. So there are people who have had chemotherapy or some antibiotics that they needed to get them through infections that have knocked out balance function. And these people cannot walk in the dark. And the other thing, take your finger, touch the side of your eye, touch it a bunch of times. See how things are bouncing when you do that? That's what someone without an inner ear gyroscope sees every time they walk down the hall. Because the inner ear is controlling your eye movements. And if you don't have it, the world is bouncing. And we have a fancy word for that called oscillopsia. That's the most extreme form. But milder forms are, you know, my balance isn't just quite right when I'm in the dark or if I'm on an uneven surface, or if it's a gravelly road, or if it's a thick carpet, because you're needing some of that other input coming in. Well, thank you all very much. I think we've uh, done our time, so. Thank you. <laughs> right.